Good morning, everyone. Uh, okay, yeah, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure today to welcome uh, Juan Bisquet, who is a professor at uh, Jaume Primer University in Castellón de la Plana, where he is also the founder and director of Institute of Advanced uh, Materials. Uh, he is the executive director at the Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters and a member of the advisory board for a number of other significant uh, journals. In his career, uh, he has published more than 400 scientific articles and uh, three books on several topics, including material science, uh, devices for energy production and storage, and measurement techniques and physical modeling to understand the charge uh, transfer and transport in such devices. And uh, on this, he will also give uh, a talk today. And last but not least, he is also a successful uh, fiction author, having published a science fiction uh, novel. Uh, I hope I didn't miss anything. So uh, without further ado, Professor Biskert, you have the word. Thank you very much. Very pleased to, to speak with, with all the colleagues and friends in, in Berlin. I hope I can I can go there soon again because I like I have been going there for for many many years, uh, especially visiting Thomas in the early 2000s and Thomas Dietrich and, and other people. So um, today we'll talk about impedance spectroscopy of of perovskites, but it's not only uh, explaining the models of impedance since there are developments uh, and uh, we want to also talk about hysteresis and this came because there is now uh, a development of membristors membristors are devices that switch between a high and low conductivity state so this is a very big hysteresis and, and membristors can also be used for uh, synapses and artificial neurons so uh, these systems uh, cannot be analyzed only in the in the frequency domain, like like solar cells. You want to analyze them also in the time domain. So there's a connection of complex memory effects, and you want to pass from from uh, characterizing by impedance to understanding the JV curve and all these things. It, it's a big problem, and I think we have some progress into this because it's quite complicated. Because these memory effects of, of perovskite come from, from uh, uh, internal ionic effects that create big polarizations, like also some, some materials for, for water splitting and CO2 reduction. So, so the, the, the material has its own dynamics inside and, and you have to, to characterize it. So this is the general problem. And uh, I briefly recall the structure of the solar cell is formed by a semiconductor absorber and two selective contacts. And each contact will take the Fermi level and of a uh, different carrier, electrons and holes. And uh, in this way, we create a um, uh, voltage, which is a difference of electrochemical potential at the metals. And this is the voltage. And then this, uh, the solar cell absorbs uh, carriers above the band gap. Uh, and these carriers can be converted into photocurrent if you have a good uh, charge extraction. So that uh, the current will be larger for a smaller band gap, but then the voltage will be smaller. And this is essentially current voltage characteristics, and all this is explained in, in the book that summarizes the three books I wrote before, and this one is called The Physics of Solar Energy Conversion, and, and it's now available for people that want to understand the basics of, of these emerging uh, solar cells and water splitting also. So when you uh, put light in the solar cell, you are extracting the current that you generate, uh, but you subtract the recombination current, and the recombination increases with voltage and finally goes down and gets the, the VOC. And from this uh, asymptotic balance of carriers generated and carriers recombined, you can get the, the diode equation, which is very important and has here a number that is. Uh, 
uh, really important for many things in the postcatchola cell now, this diode factor. So we have here total current, and here we have total voltage, but uh, this is, both cases are zero power. So we need to work in the middle and um, maximizing uh, the power JB, and this is the power point. Uh, that the, the maximum power point, and then this this power will depend on the shape, and this shape is characterized by the field factor. So that the efficiency, the product of three things, the photocurrent, field factor, the open circuit voltage, and when it is divided by the incoming um, power of, of the light, you have the, the efficiency. So, this is the, the, the JV characteristic, it's essential, uh, but it doesn't give you much information because the solar cell has different phenomena inside, the regionic, electronic, polarization, etc. And all this is not revealed in the JV core, which is not just extracted current. So that we make a, a different characterization measurements and, and since current voltage and field factor depend on internal processes, we measure them by a small perturbation at one point. And we apply a, a modulated voltage to current at one point of voltage, and then we obtain impedance spectra, where the real part is about resistance, and the imaginary part is about uh, polarization and capacitance, and all this imaginary part disappears when you go to steady state you see only resistances in this this is only resistance and the DC resistance the derivative at each point but we have much more information which is the independence represented by capacitors and you can also make time transient measurements where you apply some perturbation and see the response to this perturbation and both things are, are connected uh, we have the, the stationary response, and then we we go through the different points. And the responses are very different. They are changing a lot because uh, the internal things in the solar cell, like resistance, capacitor, etc., depend exponentially on voltage. So you have very large variations in going from one voltage to another one. And there are spectral changes. There is the generation of things that are not high voltage, you generate things that are not low voltage, they are not there. So suddenly here you see it moves into the fourth quadrant, which is something like negative capacitance. And this is happening about one volt. Okay. okay this is this is rubbish. At uh, 0.7 volt, this is rubbish is instability, which is also very important. You need the cell to be stable, otherwise the measurement doesn't make sense. But this negative arc is not uh, instability in many cases. It's real and it's a new phenomenon happening. Uh, so we want to track all that. Hmm. To track these developments, uh, we use equivalent circuits because the spectra can be summarized in an equivalent circuit. This is the typical equivalent circuit for the perovskite solar cell with two arcs. One at high frequency, high frequency is the rapid response, and low frequency is the more slow response. And the time equivalent circuit elements are characterized here by a simple relation. Tau is RC. This is the tau is the time constant. So the time constant can have some interpretation, like an intrinsic lifetime in recombination, or not. So this is not clear in general. Maybe the R and the C come from different things and the tau is just a product. But in other cases, the tau, the tau is the kinetic constant of a physical process. Okay, so you can switch from one representation to the other and uh, it's, it's convenient one or the other depending on the situation. So here I... I recall other areas where impedance was very useful. This is disensitized solar cell that many people work intensively. And then here we discovered the chemical capacitance and the chemical capacitance is an um, important element in, in solar cells because this is the, the, the capacitive element associated to the separation of the Fermi levels. So it's always there, but it can be 
smaller or bigger than other capacitances. So maybe you see or not, and in the dye solar cell, it was very visible because it was the density of state of titanium dioxide. Uh, and when you have this local uh, series of processes, this was combined to a distance because in solar cells, you always have spatial station and you need some diffusion or, or, or transport. So that this is another type of, of element that, that, is, that it is called a transmission line. It combines the RC, the fundamental process with the R of diffusion and you get a transmission line. Another challenge, uh, the dye solar cell never became very efficient, but the perovskite solar cell is becoming highly efficient. And then uh, you want to understand the, at least the recombination processes. And you have essentially two processes. You have radiative recombination that is essential because it is the uh, reverse of absorption. And you have also non-radiative recombination by surface states of uh, traps in the middle of the bang up, et cetera. So you have this, these two components. And here is very important uh, also a reciprocity principle, which the emitted photon density can be calculated from the assortivity and the black body spectrum. So this is one example. This is the fundamental model of a solar cell, which is a share model in which the bang up is sharp. So you absorb everything above the bang up. This is the, the black body spectrum. The product is the emission. So you can measure the emission and understand the radiative recombination. But then we should measure the total recombination. There are different ways to do it. And impedance cannot do it for the moment. So this is a... This is one of the remaining problems, no? how to characterize radiative and non-radiative recombination. But one thing that is emerging is that there is radiative recombination emerging from the urban tail. And uh, so you have the shock mixer, as I showed before, this is vertical, but in reality, in the perovskite solar cell, it's not vertical. You have a decay towards the bang up, and this is also generating emitted light. So from this, you can calculate uh, the uh, voltage that you can obtain. And recently, I showed that for small values of pullback energy, there is a universal curve here. But when the pullback energy is larger, they will, they will separate into different curves, but this is interesting towards characterizing the total radiative recombination because this is a measure of the ideal uh, VOC that the solar cell can achieve. And then we have a very important story is the ionic transport because um, solar cells have this structure I said, said before. You extract and inject electrons uh, at one side electrons, the other holes. That's all. But when we do some illumination, polarization, change of voltage, ion transport is on set, and then we will have ions spacing to the contact because the ions cannot go into the contact. And this will change the polarization, the contacts, uh, induce uh, ion control recombination, a lot of things. And it will change the solar cells more or less slowly, because this can go from uh, this uh, ion transport can be a few seconds, can be some days, or maybe it can be some years. So uh, when you say, is, this is stress free, okay, but did you measure for two years? Because maybe in two years, something is moving inside and it will be uh, dramatically bad for the solar cell. So this is, even though many people can make stress free and suppress a lot of transport, I think it's extremely important to understand it. That's why we use uh, the spectroscopy and then uh, 
begin with capacitances that come from the impedance spectra, because capacitances are now uh, very well understood, especially thanks to the work of my colleague uh, Germán García Belmonte. And you see, we plot the total capacitance with respect to frequency, and we have a um, plot here at uh, kilohertz, more or less constant. And this is the internal dielectric realization of the of the perovskite. This is high frequency for us, okay? the extremely low frequency for the people working at terahertz. But for us, it's high frequency because after that, a one megahertz, you, you cannot measure anymore due to the wires, etc. So this is high frequency, constant capacitance. And in low frequency, we have a very large capacitance, which is like a double Lyell effect because this is a, an ionic system. It's like a solid electrolyte. And you already see that in the case of an organic contact, this is extremely reduced. So that this, this, this rise will happen at very much smaller frequency. So this depends on the contact, uh, this low frequency behavior. Okay, so from the model I, I said before, the model with two capacitances, uh, geometric and contact capacitance and two resistances, uh, we can fit very well the data. Uh, we have the capacitance well characterized. And we need to also understand the resistances because resistances are associated to transport and recombination. And this is one important result, for example, is that here is the low frequency capacitance and the low frequency resistance, and they are correlated so that they give a constant the tau of the low frequency regime is constant. Uh, I don't know what it means, but it also depends on the size of the sample. So it's not a purely contact phenomenon. So it's something about ions at the coming at the interface and controlling some recombination. Uh, but there is a memory that the ions come from the bulk so that you depend on things. All right, so this is a, this is a basic model is two arcs. So it's two RC, two semicircles, normally well separated because the time constants are very different. But when you go to high voltage, in many cases, you have this passing to the, to the fourth quadrant of the complex plane. And here is doctor effect. This is results from group of David Cain. Uh, this is from, from Fabrega Santiago, my colleague. This is very typical, uh, especially in bromide samples, we, we get it all the time. So uh, this is the famous negative capacitance, but um, it's not really negative. So this is uh, my recent uh, conclusion, is that uh, this is a good equivalent circuit to describe the response. So it's not negative because it's a positive inductor. So this is the key element, and we can derive it from basic uh, kinetic consideration. So uh, you can see that there are two resistances in parallel. So in the mid frequency range, you have only the RB. But when you go to low frequency, the inductor becomes a wire. So you have also RB. So this decrease of the resistance is associated to the inductor. And this, for example, uh, as uh, uh, explained in the paper by Fabregat, uh, this is reducing the combination. So, so somehow something is on set at low frequency that gives more recombination and less efficiency to the solar cell. <clears throat> this is the impedance spectrum, this uh, hook shape. When we plot the capacitance, this part of course gives negative. So these are negative capacitance when you plot the capacitance. But there is no, there could be a purely negative C, but that is not in this model. Okay, so this is an important difference. Okay, so now the the when we go to more complex sample, this is the carbon cell from Swansea. Then we have a lot of things different phenomena, effects, and then we add elements to the equivalent circuit. This is important, for example, R2, C2. This is uh, something that will vanish at low frequency, 
but it's important for the impedance spectra. So there is a combination and our current work uh, is, uh, is to find a robust uh, QNN circuit. So this is what we are doing now. Okay, now I will talk about the MEM restore. The MEM restore is a system that will switch from high resistance to low resistance, more current. So, and the Perovskite MEM restore I show here, it has a baseline uh, resistance and then boom, it goes up at a certain voltage. Okay, and it can be switched back again to the initial state. So it has, let us say, on off, but uh, you, you can change the, the conductivity. Uh, the change remains if you don't if you don't reset. So that this is a very good system for uh, for switching memories and for storage of information. This is one application. The structure of the memory uh, system is simply this is a. a, a a resistor, but the resistor depends on the internal state variable x in this case. So that x, x is a time dependent equation. So that the current, the, the, the conductivity now, g, will depend on the, what happened to the internal variable in the past. So this is a memory effect and can be very strong. That's why it's be valued because it depends on what you are doing in the past via this internal state variable X. In, there have been already, I don't know, 100 or two papers on perovskite membrane restores. Most of them use mechanism of a conducting filament. So these mobile ions, maybe coming from the electrode, will make a filament and the resistance the resistance will be extremely decreased. So there's a, 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 a rapid onset of the ductivity state, and this can be switched back. But our work with uh, Ankur Solanki and Chen Song and colleagues in Castelló, um, this is a 2D uh, perovskite mem restore, and it's a good mem restore, stable and reproducible and we think it's working by another mechanism which is a ductility in the layer so there's a reaction of incoming ions and this creates a silvioidite layer for example and that's what makes the conductivity increase so we can have been restored by surface mechanism We measure when we measure the in the initial paper, this was not very stable because you can see that it's the resistance is coming down here, decreasing with time, so it's not stabilized. But then uh, Antonio and Cedric uh, really stabilized the, the memory store so that it, it goes up at a certain point. We can measure the impedance when we are coming close to the set. And there is a big transformation because initially it's two arcs like the typical model, but when we come to the threshold, it's coming the inductor here suddenly. So the inductor is saying that you are going to make the transistor. So this is important information. And we can treat this in connection with the problem of hysteresis. Okay, in the hysteresis in JV curves, you are doing a ramp voltage. The voltage is increasing linearly with time. And to do that, you do small steps. Depends how you do it. If the steps are very slow, then the curve will reach each step equilibrium. But if you go faster, then you don't reach equilibrium each step so that going forward and backward is different and this was called hysteresis discovered in the year 14 or so since the beginning so that it's a very typical effect but it's extremely difficult to to describe now you can describe it you can okay this hysteresis because i understand but 
the problem is addiction. Some of the first results were connecting the typical RC arc with two with two arcs uh, that I showed before. This is the typical element. Okay, we have a strong capacitance because the capacitance low frequency is very large. So everybody knows that with capacitance, you get a capacitive current and this current is going to increase. This is the current of a constant capacitor because the capacitive current is proportional to, to, to scan rate and to the capacitance. So we are going to increase the current. So if we increase the scan rate of the JD measurement, we are going to increase the current. This is what happens in hysteresis. In one case, you increase it, in the other decrease it. So this is the simple observation of capacitive current. Okay. So when we put illumination, it's the other way around. So the forward current is higher than the backward current. This is capacitive hysteresis. And it was, in fact, already in year 15 with Nankyu Park and Hyun Kim and other people, we could connect the hysteresis to the capacitance. Large capacitance, larger hysteresis. Hysteresis removed with organic contacts, less capacitance. So there was this connection, and it's well known for many years. So that this behavior that they showed at the beginning is the capacitive hysteresis. By a, simply by a voltage ramp. In fact, uh, my colleague Germa, by subtracting the background JV curve, we found the square behavior of capacitive currents and the proportionality to scan rate. Okay, all this is very nice, but then came the other type of hysteresis. This is a, a paper with the group of Hong Wei Han, where they were modifying only the TO2 compact layer, changing the hysteresis from normal to the other way around. The forward current is higher than the reverse current, and this was called inverted hysteresis. Now, positive capacitance is giving more current. It turns out that the inductor is going to leave less current. And this has been recognized only very recently. Now it looks obvious. Oh, it's obvious, but it wasn't so obvious. Uh, there's a connection of the dominant equivalent circuit and the hysteresis you are going to get because here the current is going to go the other way around and be less. And in fact, the first paper was done by Fran Fabregat uh, last year, showing the inverted hysteresis in relation to the inductive arc here was very clearly demonstrated. Now we can see the main restore. The main restore going forward, then backward towards the set. It's a huge inverted hysteresis. It's very big. Okay. And in fact, we obtain the inductor when we go to the region of the transition. So all this is taking good shape. But the question is, Okay, this is very nice, but can we predict hysteresis? Can we use impedance to predict hysteresis? Hysteresis is still important. This is the recent work, the PIN tandem in energy environmental science. If you look in the support information, you see still important hysteresis, and this is capacity connected to the impedance. So it's something we still need to understand and control. So the problem here would be to measure impedance and to predict how much hysteresis you are going to have. And also use the impedance to understand the origin of hysteresis because hysteresis is extremely difficult to understand with models. There are lots of models, but here I would like to switch from one to the other and to get independent information about hysteresis and not just the direct measurement. So this is the... The paper we did, this summer, about this problem is theory of hysteresis by integration of the equivalent circuit. The point is that we can measure the hysteresis 
see the scan rate dependence of AD curves. We can measure at different points the impedance. And then we would like to take the impedance, the equivalent circuit, and from this predict the hysteresis and see if they match, because then we will have more information about the hysteresis. What is difficult about hysteresis? That when you uh, said before that we have a internal variable. So here you have the JV curve of a solar cell, and then we have the slope is the reciprocal of the resistance. We could integrate the resistance values and obtain the JV curve. That's very clear. But when we have the stresses, there is a memory effect. What happens at one point with the JV curve depends on the as dynamics of this W, which is the internal state variable of the memory store. So you cannot simply integrate. To integrate anything, you have to integrate the memory variable before, and it looks a little bit complicated. So uh, we developed a method to do this, which is take the equivalent circuit and convert them into a series of time domain uh, equations. Decide what is the external perturbation, for example, this is for JV curve, and then solve uh, numerically to find the behavior from the data of the circuit. So this is one example. CRC, you apply the method of nodes. This is basically electrical circuit theory. And then you can get differential equation. You need to solve the second first because this is the memory function. Okay, you solve the second, integrate in the first one, and then we have a prediction of hysteresis. If it is inductive, then you have the equations that this model gives you, which are other equations, but you can do the same for any model. You can integrate it. It might be difficult because the elements depend exponentially, then you can integrate numerically in principle. Okay, so here are the results. From this model, which is capacitive, I, we can uh, integrate the equations and predict the regular hysteresis, which is the one that is capacitive. And from the Inductive model, the same. You make the time domain equation and integrate them and predict the inverted hysteresis. So I think this is a, a first step to a method of solution to predict hysteresis. It's a first step because we didn't analyze yet uh, complex cases, which is what you want to do. But we have some results because we have lots of cells measured in the in the lab and from collaborators, etc. And we can see here the regular hysteresis related to capacitive behavior. And we can see here the inverted hysteresis related to the inductive behavior. So there is a strong connection to begin with. This gives us a general explanation of why one is inductive and the other is capacitive, and it's obeyed uh, normally. So uh, to summarize this, we turn the impedance spectroscopy into a set of differential equations so that you don't have to invent a model because the, the QNS circuit tells you which are the variables that you need. And then you can solve it to the time domain to predict hysteresis. And this is a very interesting thing. This is a bromide solar cell. And you can see now that it's going to change from capacitive to inductive. Okay. And this is something impressive that. The change is occurring at the place where the QNS circuit is changing from capacitive to inductor. When the inductor comes in, change the hysteresis, and the JV curves change a lot. So this is the up and diode quality factors, and if every one of you can recognize, this is the M numbers are changing. So there's a connection between the M numbers, the kinetics, and it's quite complex, but I think we can progress in this direction. You can find also the connection to other techniques. This is transient photovoltaic and transient photocurrent, which is a perturbation of voltage and follow the subsequent decays. So uh, you can compare time domain and frequency domain. In frequency domain, you have impedance spectroscopy, 
intensity modulated photocurrent spectroscopy, intensity modulated voltage spectroscopy, and connect these techniques. So here we made also a first uh, passing from one to the other, at least theoretically. So I think this will be also a powerful development. Okay, I want to explain very rapidly the last point, which is uh, the work towards neurons, uh, which is uh, developing from the previous work. And now there's a lot of interest to make uh, synapses and networks, and sorry, and neurons uh, from perovskite and many other materials to make artificial networks for computation and especially spiking networks. So that uh, do we have a neuron is an element that is receiving inputs of uh, action potentials and combines them and sends another action potential. And the connection from between neurons is controlled by synapses. A neuron is controlled by, is described by an equivalent circuit because the potential of the neuron is controlled by current exchanges of ionic species between the interior and the exterior. And you can see that this is very similar to what is happening in the solar cell, where also this ionic dynamics is controlling the response as in the memory store I explained before. This was discovered by Hodgkin and Huxley in 1950, more or less. And they could formulate the current model, which is accepted by everyone in neuroscience, where you have different ion channels, and each channel has its uh, representation as a variable capacitor, uh, extremely sensitive to the voltage, so that when some perturbation comes, these different channels enter into a set of positive and negative feedback so that the voltage increases and then decreases, rest here for a time. And when you combine this action potential, it becomes repetitive. And this is how networks communicate, transmit information. This is how the brain, this is the basic uh, operation of the, of the brain. So if we are able to build these neurons and these synapses, then we can make spiking computation which is uh, something very interesting, for example, for extracting immediate conclusion from perception, recognition, etc. How can the impedance spectroscopy apply to this? Because we can characterize the natural response of neurons, and then we can characterize the response of the candidates that we build, compare them. That would be an important characterization method because we can see the dynamical effects of the simple of the system, not only in the time domain, also by impedance that has a full spectroscopy. So we did a preliminary work into that with uh, my student Agustin and made a first paper. And now I am making another one in which I want also to go to bifurcations because. This is uh, the chaos theory and all that, which is very interesting, in which the neuron is close to a bifurcation because the neuron is resting. And suddenly, if it's kicked off by some external perturbation, it can start this spiking uh, domain. And this is something that was very well studied in the 1990s by Mark Koppel and other scientists, but uh, Koppel is the one who made the the dominant papers, right? because you can do this with electrochemical systems. You make electrochemical systems, and then you can make them oscillate, like spiking neurons. And this, you make criteria of stability using impedance spectroscopy. Here you can see, for example, the inductive impedance, the pattern that the same that I explained before, and then something going into negative capacitance and returning to positive, and something being totally negative. So this impedance spectra tell you when the system is going to oscillate or not. And this is uh, well known for all these years since the 90s. 
so I am thinking a very simple, the Hodgkin Hodgley model, it's quite complex because it has three different channels. So it's four differential equations, but here are simplification made by Fishhawk in 1960, which is only two differential equations. And then uh, Nagumo in 1962, they observed that this is an equivalent circuit containing an inductor, and this is called Fishhawk Nagumo model, and it's the simplest model of uh, oscillation. So now I have calculated the impedance. Uh, this will be published in one week or so. Uh, the main thing is that the spiking network contains negative resistance. Okay, this is not in the memory store. It needs a negative resistance that produces the instability. The same thing as in the electrochemical oscillators. It can be visible or it can be hidden because it has resistances in parallel, like the perovskite. So, but the negative resistance has to be there. When this happens, you can calculate all the spectra of the different situations with the, this is the fundamental equivalent circuit of the neuron, of the fifth horn neuron, but it can be here, be, has to be negative. And then I can find the, the hop bifurcation, which is passing through a certain value, the dynamics is stable, coming to a stable point, suddenly it becomes not stable. It's climate cycle, it starts going around. This is the neuron spiking. This is extremely, this is the spectrum was discovered by Mark Hopper, and it's called the hidden negative impedance. So I think uh, I can, we can have a strong um, methods of characterization for going to the equilibrium to so in conclusion, this is the minimal neuron model. It's the same model as the sky memory store, but so it has the polarization, the inductor, and the negative resistance. So I think uh, new systems like neuristors and, and memristors and neurons uh, are going to give a lot of insight to understand better the perovskite solar cell because they show uh, extremal phenomena. And at this moment, I think we can get progress in relating the impedance to the time domain, which, which and this is what we need. So I want to acknowledge, uh, especially the colleagues uh, doing this work with me, Antonio Guerrero, Agustin, Cedric, and Hector. And uh, for starting researchers, I recommend again my book, but I also made a collection of videos, and this is in the Nanogy page. And I put 25 uh, chapters of explanation of the main concept. So you can go there and see it freely without uh, paying anything. This is uh, a service to the community.